pleased to be joined this afternoon by Alexandra Brodsky and Emma Schwartz. We're going to have a discussion today about stealthing and about a term you may not have heard, rape adjacent. What does that mean? Let me start with you, Alexandra. Sure. Uh, and thanks so much for having us and for hosting this conversation. Um, you know, uh, the term I think is used uh, to refer to forms of sexual violence that people experience all the time, um, but might not be recognized as forms of violence, might not be recognized as, as uh, serious as rape. Um, and I think that that, you know, I, I first came across a survivor using that language when I did research into stealthing into non-consensual condom removal uh, back in 2016 when I was a law student. Uh, and I think it was a way for uh, survivors to recognize that the forms of violence that they had experienced were related to rape, um, shared similar causes, had similar effects. Uh, while also recognizing the sort of unique nature of this particular harm when someone removes a condom during otherwise consensual sex. Uh, and that's, um, you know, a betrayal of trust, uh, a betrayal of bodily autonomy. Um, and it's been, uh, you know, I, I wrote this article back in, uh, published in 2017. While you were at Yale Law School as a student. Yes, I just, I just graduated when it came out. Law review articles take forever. And um, it's been really powerful for me to see people like Emma run with this um, and uh, really shine a light on this harm and point us towards solutions. And this and this became a very influential article when you when you wrote it. Weirdly, it did. You know, I wrote it as a term paper for a class. I really didn't expect anyone other than, you know, my professor and my mom to read it, but it ended up sort of shooting around the internet, getting some coverage. And I think that that's not because people find law review articles so interesting. I'm pretty sure we have a lot of evidence that that's not the case, um, but that people uh, saw something described that they had experienced and that they didn't have language for, that they um, didn't know other people experienced. And you're about a half decade now into your professional practice. What what do you do now? What type of law do you practice? What are you what are you working on? Sure. So I mean, I should be clear that I'm here in my personal capacity. Sure. Don't blame my employer for anything I say, but I work as a civil rights lawyer on a range of issues. And a lot of my practice continues to be focused on uh, survivors of sexual abuse, um, particularly students. Um, and uh you know, that's been, uh, you know, there is so much important work to be done here and there are so few lawyers to go around. Um, and so that's been, uh, you know, a really, uh, you know, moving experience for me. But again, lawyering isn't the only way that we make change around sexual violence. That certainly isn't true. There's so much, you know, we need be new and better laws so that lawyers can do something with them. But also there's so much work to be done around just culture change and, uh, you know, the TV show, I May Destroy You a couple of years ago, had an episode about non-consensual condom removal. And to me, that was such a breakthrough moment because there's only so much that law does. There's only so much that policy does. And giving people vocabulary, uh, sort of doing some prevention education work through media, um, you know, that, you know, that's that's so important to make sure people don't need laws in the first place. We're going to involve Emma in the conversation in, in just a second, but I, I want to keep talking about this for just another minute. Um, this isn't a novel concept, stealthing. This is illegal in a number of European jurisdictions, uh, both criminally and civilly. You know, it's been interesting to see over the past couple of years uh, some countries outside the United States uh, and also a couple of states try to figure out, is there any way to use our existing laws against sexual violence, against battery, uh, to try to encompass these harms? And so there have been a couple of, uh, it's, you know, uh, Canada, Australia, a couple of other countries have said, you know, we don't need a special law just against non-consensual condom removal because when someone removes the condom without their partner's consent, that transforms the sex into sexual violence. It's no longer consensual. So we don't need a new special law. Um, you know, we some people have tried that in the United States to mixed success. Uh, and I know that that's one of the reasons why advocates like Emma are really uh, 
you know, passionate about getting states to pass new laws that specifically name this harm so that a judge can't say, hey, that doesn't really fit the definition, or I don't really think that's what the legislature was talking about when they passed this law, you know, to have a law that says you cannot do this specific thing. Okay. Emma Schwartz, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. So Emma, you are a close friend of my daughter's yes. and thus me, and you have reached an age uh, as a senior in high school, where as a parent, um, you are in this nebulous gray area where you do things that are adult things uh, that your parents don't want to think about, though we um, know they're going on because uh, we were your age once and did all of these did all of these things. And you'll know what I'm know what I'm talking about. So watching you grow up, um, with my daughter, it comes to pass that you're at a high school party and you have an experience. You have consensual sex with a boy and that boy removes the condom uh, during sex and then afterwards admits it. Um, but you are left unsatisfied uh, with his explanations and the loss of control and agency. It's something you've talked to me a lot about as we've talked about the issue. And so those are the those are the details about about what happened. And I, I don't want you to feel like you have to go blow by blow by blow beyond that. But when you when you think about this issue, what is it that you are trying to do? You've started an organization to make change, to to change the law. And I know someone as a young woman who is uh, going to be rising in her sophomore year at NYU, um, you know, Alexandra is someone that you very much look up to um, uh, as somebody, you know, that you're following in the footsteps of, you know, somebody who herself at a, at a young age has made an impact, made a difference with her advocacy, her commitments, you know, to pursue justice, which I want to have a broader discussion about, um, you know, from, you know, from the, from, from this answer. Yes. So this, um, I was stealth, I guess you could put it that way. I was actually at my boyfriend at the time's Christmas party. It wasn't necessarily a high school party. It was his family's Christmas party. Um, and this happened to me and it completely rocked my world. All I knew was that something was wrong. Like that was not okay. That wasn't normal. That shouldn't have happened. And I came home and I, I completed a Google search in a private browser because I was, you know, so scared of, you know, the possibility of someone seeing my search history. Then I looked up, is it sexual assault if my boyfriend removed his condom without my consent? And the results were varying, but the name that, um, you know, was very at the forefront was Alexandra's name. And I went into a deep dive. I read your law article and it just spiraled from there, just knowing everything and attempting to understand what happened, why, how you can go on from this. Um, and it was shocking because as someone who it happened to, like in the moments afterwards, you have a conversation in your mind where you're, you're you know, unsure if that's assault, right? But it only feels wrong. And then to look it up and see that it's not that it's so prevalent that it has a nickname is just devastating. So yes, from there, I mean, I have had the worst year of my life. I would say it's definitely getting better now. Um, but I like to say that, you know, out of all of this, I just don't want anyone else to go through what I had to go through. Um, I was told time after time again, that there is no precedent for this legally. And I think that's the most frustrating thing I've ever heard is, okay, so I, I was assaulted. How do I go about getting justice? And 
that's where my project, my family's project, we have started together. It's called the adjacent project. As Alexandra said, one of the biggest terms is rape adjacent. We worked with Utah State Senator McKell to make amendments to Senate Bill 178 that would make the removal of a sexually protective device without the consent of the other partner illegal. And it was proposed to be a felony at first, but was dropped down to a misdemeanor. And it passed unanimously out of the Senate, the Utah State Senate, and then it got shut down in the House. So we're working to um, do it again next session. Um, and that's in the state of Utah. Are there any states where this has been made illegal, either criminally or civilly? Um, so California currently is the only state in America, and it's civilly, um, which is great. At least there's something there. It's definitely a starting point. But um, And I've spent a lot of my career working in po California politics, um, including in the California state legislature. And, you know, the reality is, is that a lot of things that um, spread around the country from a jurisprudence perspective start in the state of California. Uh, from a regulatory perspective, but I want to I want to broaden now the conversation um, to a discussion about the term violence as associated by this. This is something until you talked to me about it, I was unfamiliar with, was unfamiliar with the name, but doesn't lessen uh, by my unfamiliarity the damage or the impact to any person that that this happens to. So, you know, I wanted to go back to you, Alexandra, and say um, to ask first off. So, this is obviously a male phenomenon, right? This is the the men or the stealthers, right? Who are who are removing condoms? Is this a is this an issue? that you find in the gay community as as well? Yeah, so um, it is certainly uh, people wearing condoms who are the ones to take it off, but right. the victims are victims of all genders. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, while I've certainly, you know, heard from and talked to a lot of, uh, you know, women who have experienced this. I've also talked to men, and I think that there's a particular shame that uh, male victims of sexual violence experience, and particular barriers to coming forward um, for any kind of abuse. Where we sort of have a vision of who, you know, who can be a victim of sexual abuse, and we imagine a you know, beautiful white woman who is straight and has never had sex before and never uses drugs or alcohol. Uh, and any time that someone deviates from that, they face, you know, I think they face extra levels of disbelief. That you I'm, don't happy you, I'm happy you brought that that point up because it this conversation, um, you know, I'm of a certain age where it just mentally connects to a very famous Jodie Foster movie. Um, and in that movie... Um, I see by your by your smile, you're, you're familiar with what I'm talking about. I think the title of it was Accused, and Jodie Foster is in a is in a bar, and Jodie Foster is violently gang raped in the bar. Now, at that time in culture, as rape and sexual violence against women was surfacing and becoming more prominent in the in the culture, and I'm somebody who believes that everything in politics happens downrange from culture. And so in that movie, um, where you see this brutal rape scene on the on a pool table, um, a controversial scene, the the accusations, right, against the the victim, right, are well, she was dressed for it, right? She deserved it. And we've come a long way. Right. I, I think just as a casual observer, right, of these subjects in the culture from that to here. But when you look at sexual violence and changing mores around it, um, there was once a conventional standard uh, that a husband could not rape his wife, um, that a um, woman who was scantily dressed was both asking for and deserving of a of a sexual attack. And so the issues of non-consensual date rape, well, 
we were kissing. She was unconscious, and therefore I continued forward with the with the act. No, no, that's in fact rape. So our definitions, right, have expanded. So this is another expansion, right, of a definition around the issue of consent, the concept of violence. And before we get into judicial punishment, civilly or criminally, in that in that discussion, what I wanted to ask you is the use of the word violence. Is this violence? Should we think about it as violence? Um, what do you say, right, to the 65-year-old white lady in Iowa, right, who's like, I don't know if that's rape. I don't know what rape adjacent means, and I'm not sure that that's really violence. You know, to my mind, it is so clearly violent because it is someone uh, being physically touched in a really intimate way that they did not agree to. Um, and I think that uh, for, you know, just thinking intuitively for about it for a second, I think most people have the gut instinct that if a person is that their body is penetrated by someone else in a way that they didn't agree to, that, that is such a violation. Um, and I think we also see that reflected then in the ways that survivors talk about the experience, about this um, feeling of you know, losing the right to say what happens to their bodies. And that's the through line in all kinds of different forms of sexual abuse. And I think that there's, you know, and you're absolutely right that we have, um, you know, uh, such uh, such a narrow vision of what violence looks like that a lot of that that excludes a huge amount of sexual violence. I think you know it's maybe tried to say this at this point, but the trope of rape being someone who jumps out, you know, a person's walking down an alley and someone jumps out at them, and you know it's a stranger and has a, you know a gun to their head, and that's the only thing that counts as rape. That is a tiny, tiny portion of sexual violence that occurs. Most of it is between people who know each other. Much of it is between people who have pre-existing sexual relationships. Um, but that doesn't make it any any less of a betrayal, any less of a violation. And I'll say, I think it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, the 65-year-old woman, because I actually think that some women in particular are uniquely invested in policing what counts as violence, because it's really important to them that what happened to them wasn't violent. That's, you know, women have experienced so many kinds of violations, um, you know, harassment in the workplace, violence in their marriages, that they sometimes feel invested in saying, no, 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 what happened to me was fine, don't worry about it. And look, I'm not going to put words in anyone's mouth. If you don't want to call what happened to you sexual assault, we don't have to have, we don't have to call it sexual assault. But that is, that does that's not a reason to uh, try to delegitimize the experience that another person has had. Now, let me ask you this question. When I started talking to Emma about this, the, the very first miscarriage of justice that, that pops into my head um, when, we, when we talk about this issue is I'm thinking 18-year-old Black guy, proverbial, anonymous, you know, made up, 18-year-old Black kid, 17-year-old white girl, Birmingham, Alabama, let's say. Um, and there's an accusation um, that is you know, not entirely factual um, because you have parents who have a certain type of reaction and these type of accusations um, are not, not without precedent. So when you, when you think about um, a population of 18, 19, 20-year-olds that are at the front edge of their sexual lives and journeys and, and experience. Condoms do fall off during during sexual, right, during sexual intercourse. How 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 does the the most at risk part of the population to be abused by a false accusation in the criminal justice system, be protected from this type of accusation, which is at the at, at its core, right, is is taking taking place at a at a line of intimacy, right? That's that's very far forward, if you will. And do you, and do you think that's a fair question? Well, you know. 
I think there's a, there are a couple of things going on there. So to break it down, you know, I think it is absolutely right that when we are talking about any kind of allegation, sexual or otherwise, that we need to be worried about racism in the criminal justice system whenever we're talking about a criminal charge. And I want to be clear that um, the, you know, the, the bill in California, the bills that I've advocated for are all, are all civil laws. So there's no risk of prison at the end. But whenever we're talking about our legal system and particularly our criminal legal system, we need to be worried about racism, certainly against people accused. There is, you know, as you, uh, you know, allude to a long history of false allegations against Black men uh, being used as a tool of white supremacy. And we also need to be concerned about uh, racism toward victims. So there's also a long history stretching back to slavery of uh, white men being allowed to sexually abuse Black women with impunity. It was literally not illegal to rape a Black ens enslaved person for decades in this country, uh, if not longer. And, um, but again, that's not, you know, I think it is a mistake to say, so I think we, it is a mistake to say that because of this history, we can't provide remedies to people who have been sexually violated. Um, both because, you know, white people are not the only people who face sexual violence, far from it. Um, and so it's not doing Black survivors any good to take away remedies. Um, because this is a problem with our legal system writ large, it's not a unique problem to sexual violence. So the racial disparities in um, uh, criminal prosecution and uh, uh, convictions are actually less for sexual offenses than for crimes writ large. Um, so that is that there's a smaller gap between um, sort of the, dispropor or the, the disproportionate, sorry, I'm gonna, let me start over on, on that part. Um, there is a, uh, there, there's a, there's less of a pronounced racial disparity in prosecutions and convictions for sexual offenses than for other offenses. And that doesn't mean it's not a problem. Of course, it's a problem. It's all a problem. We need to fix that across our criminal justice system. But it, that means that it's not a problem unique to sexual violence. And it's not a reason to leave survivors in the lurch. Um, I would also just say that I think, um, I'm sort of not sympathetic to the critique that sexual violence happens just because I don't take you to be saying this, but just sort of like posing the question of, you know, sexual violence happens between because young people don't quite know, uh, you know, how to, you know, get what the rules are. Um, the All of the laws that I have seen that would address non-consensual condom removal, first of all, talk about intentional removal of a condom. So it's not, it's not a condom slipping off. And there's all of this evidence that shows that young people know what consent is. They know when their partner doesn't want to have sex or participate in a particular sex act. They just kind of trick themselves into thinking it doesn't matter. They just come up with justifications to, you know, you know, disregard the no uh, and try to pick up on any hint of a yes. So I, have, I don't know. I have high standards for young people because I think that they've proven themselves. OK, so 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 both of you and, and Emma, I want you to jump in here as well. Um, th there is a broader current. Right. Uh, clearly in in society, um, from my perspective, we have a real deal, real life extremist movement loose. It's autocratic in nature. Um, there are elements of that ideology that are fused. There's a bit of populism. There's a bit of religious fanaticism. Uh, a couple dashes of fascism, um, and then some homegrown American populism in it. But within that movement, we've we've seen the abortion right through Roe versus Wade peeled away um, in a grotesque act of judicial activism, in, in my view. Um, that act of judicial activism is exceeded by the actions of the federal judge Kazmarek, who by fiat um, outlaws a drug that women use uh, both as an abortion drug, but it's also a necessary drug for a million women a year that have um, that have miscarriages in America. So all of these issues to me fall under an umbrella of government control. Um, and, and primarily when you're when you're going to, for example, like Emma to the Utah legislature, right, government control when when Emma goes and, and does her first activism 
and and meets the government, the person who's sitting across the table looking back, state senator, whatever, is is almost overwhelmingly a white male, right? So that's that's the government. So these policies of control, right, that are very much front and center, and at the same time, right, you have a cause which is an assertion of power and agency and individual sovereignty saying, no, this isn't trivial what happened. You did not have consent to do this. And thus that lack of consent um, is a violent act. And that's what you who haven't heard about this before need to get your head around just in the same way a generation before you had men needed to get their head around the fact that just because a woman was dressed in a way that you found suggestive and provocative did not make her a target for your sexual abuse, violence, harassment, or whatever. So I, I wanted to talk about that duality, right? That in a in a moment, right, where there is a, a politics of control being asserted that targets women, clearly, in my view, um, you are asserting, right, for women, a new power and a new agency. So those those two things, right, run it run into each other when you meet Mr. Uh, and Mrs. Republican legislator primarily. And I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts and reaction, including that you may think I'm completely nuts on that observation. I mean, I think there's validity in what you're saying, but I think that we need to, as a society, just acknowledge when things are wrong, right? Like, um, I would say that I experienced, let me rephrase that. Um, when I first met with the Utah State Senator Mikkel, um, he said, you never want to be like, see how laws are made because you're going to be incredibly disappointed. And he was right. So when we what disappoints you about it, the speed of it? Um, no, because there's a lot to cover. I understand the speed and the necessity to move things along quickly. And you, you, you know, you only have so little time to do it in session. Um, but seeing exactly how it was made. Um, so when I'm just speaking from experience with the bill I uh, brought into legislation, I guess, um, was that it passed unanimously on the in the Senate House committee, committee and then out of the Senate as well, and it was on its way to the House. I had never experienced anything like it. I had never felt the need to you know, I, I came on on Zoom and I testified. I made a two minute statement and um, one after the next, there was an endless string of old white men, as you mentioned. Um, and, you know, we talk about these things that, you know, just those, the old boys, whatever. Um, but I'd never seen, I have, I mean, I, I'm getting a little like choked up. I've never seen anything like it. Um, a criminal defense attorney in Utah, Mark Moffitt, um, came in to testify against it. And he argued that stealthing legislation is going to be, quote, prosecuting against men. And the persons that are going to be most at risk of this particular crime are going to be young, inexperienced boys and men. He went on to say it would, quote, lead to criminal criminalization of sexual naivety which I would like to say um, survivor and activist Chanel Miller has never said anything so beautifully um, in her impact uh, victim impact statement. She said, we cannot be a society that forgives someone's first sexual assault. We cannot learn that it is wrong through trial and error, right? It is wrong. I am like forgetting the name of the man who again in the house came up to the stand to say that, well, we all know what's wrong. And then he went on to say that we're just too ahead of the times, right? How does that make you feel when, I mean, when like, somebody says that? Does it inspire you to dig deeper and to fight harder? Does it does it does the encounter with the American government and the legislature kind of induce that that moment of hmm, 
you know, this isn't this isn't quite like civics class. I gotta I gotta step back and and figure this out. And I think, you know, Alexandra, I guess like the question I would ask you, right, in relation to that, I suspect you're a different attorney than you were six years ago, coming out of coming out of law school in the in the advocacy of of civil rights on a on a whole host of issues. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I feel like I have spent the last six years uh, hearing similar things, Emma, and I wish that that weren't true. But I feel um, like, you know, when I, you know most of my litigation is behalf on, uh, on behalf of students and not um, all of the survivors are women, but most of them are women and not all of the people who uh, assaulted them are men, but most of the people who assaulted them are men. And a thing that comes up from their schools when they're seeking help from their schools, and then unfortunately sometimes from courts, is that they they see those young men as having futures and they don't understand that the young women have futures too. That they are thinking about what is it going to mean for you know this young man um, in high school if we find you know that we that you know if we believe that this that he's sexually assaulted this woman and maybe you know he's suspended for you know, a short period of time, what is that going to mean for where he can go to college? What is that going to mean for his life? And no one stops to think, what is it going to mean for this young woman if she is spending the rest of her high school education with a person who raped her? How is she going to do on that math test when he's sitting two chairs behind her? And none of this means that, uh, you know, we shouldn't be concerned about fair procedures. I read a whole book about what it means to investigate sexual harassment fairly, because that's in everyone's best interest. There would be fair pr procedures, not to sort of be dueling between two extremes of, uh, you know, believing no allegations and believing every allegation. But survivors deserve to be heard. Survivors deserve a chance to you know, get their foot in court and have a chance, just the chance to prove what happened to them. Um, and, uh, you know, I, the whole idea that it just sort of kills me, the whole idea that we all know that this is wrong, but let's let's give it some time. Let's, let, let's wait. What that's saying is that no one cares about all the survivors that this is happening to today, that they just need to suck it up for a couple more years so that, you know, the, the boys can learn to, you know, do better somehow. Yeah. This is this is an age old sentiment also. Right. This is this is at the core of Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail to the white pastors who say to him that, you know, you are right, of course, but wrong place, wrong time. Um, and, you know, Martin Luther King makes the makes the point I'm here because this is where the injustice is. And so with with this issue, like any anyone of a number of others over time, um, you are pushing into a into a new space. And what you're saying is something happened to me that was transgressive. I don't want it to happen to anybody else. And, and therefore, I'm going to change the law. And that's that's quite a thing. Um for a 20 year old to 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 walk out of this experience resolved to do so talk about that because because whether whether you know it or not and i feel like because i know you i can take a little bit of liberty with that is that's a that's a tremendous act of faith that that comes out of this this violation and when you can transfer um, something terrible that happened to you into an act of, of faith, um, which is that difficult though it may be, I can change the law and it's my birthright to do so as an American. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? I mean, yeah, I think that at the beginning of it all, I had never experienced i sorry some speaking about this is very emotional but um okay. i was not to like very much boost my own horn i think i was one of the happiest people i've ever met like looking in the mirror you know and people would tell me these things that you know emma you're just such a calming soul i love your you know your presence and i'm not I feel like, you know, 
saying this is very odd, but it's true. And then something is taken away from you. I didn't have the choice. Um, it wasn't, it happened without my consent, right? So I, I put my hand down on the bed and then boom, I feel, I'm like, what is that? What's cold and rubber? And in that moment, my whole life was flipped upside down. I was severely depressed, severely anxious. I had never been this kind of person so, so angry. And as you said before, like, does this anger drive you forward a thousand percent, right? I think that anger and love are like the two most driving factors in the world. And when you're feeling so much anger as I did, I not necessarily even anger, but so much not understanding, you know, why me? Why would someone do this? You know, you claim to love someone. Why would you hurt someone you claim to love? All of these things. What just in general, why would you hurt another being like that is inexplainable. But I think that in my process of healing, I needed to feel like I was doing something. Um, and it's not true for everyone, right? You know, everyone heals differently. No survivor is the same in their journey. But um, it was the one thing I could grab onto that gave me hope. And it started with, you know, my own civil suit was, okay, I can make this boy aware of what he has done by filing a lawsuit because he was so oblivious. Yes, did he apologize? And yes, right? This is all in writing that he knows it was right. He apologized. He knows he did it. He admitted to doing it. It's in writing. So taking that and saying, okay, yes, you said like you've done this. Now it's time for accountability, right? These, these people don't have accountability at certain points. And so that was the first step, just making the knowledge um, to myself that he would be aware of how terribly he hurt me was just the first tick in my brain that made me feel a little better. And then it progressed because I don't think I will ever have closure. I mean, it has been already over a year and that's very, very short in a timeline of survivors, right? I'm going to live with this my whole life. So what am I going to do about it? And while I had this civil suit going on, I know I didn't seem to be getting what I wanted. And I think that's where the, you know, the difference between civil and criminal comes in. Um, we can talk about that later, but to me, bringing this law or this movement forward is firstly helping me heal but secondly, when I say I don't want this to happen to other people, right, by by doing all these all these things, I know that's not the case, right? This is going to happen to more people. But when people, when legislators say that we know it's, we all know it's wrong, but we can't do anything about it yet. To me, I think, well, if we clarify that it's wrong in America and in other places, and we set a precedent, right, the the precedent that's not there for me, but I hope is there for other people, then the knowledge of it being being in place is going to prevent things, right? Like we all know stealing is wrong. You can you can go to jail for stealing, right? Why shouldn't, you, you know, does this make sense that if we all know it's wrong? Um, well, Alexandra, I wanted, I wanted to ask you, like responding responding to Emma is, you know, when I listen to her, the man she describes who comes in and testifies at the state legislative hearing and it, it basically says that hey you know the young men can be a little bit randy and a little bit naughty and you know they may need a do-over or two what what do you what would you say um to your average 18 year old male Americanus, right? Who's who's out there, right? Wanting to date, right? Have sex, right? And do all the things that that young people, right? Want to want to do, right? From the perspective of, you know, someone who is age proximate um, to them, that this isn't a joke. This is violence, and your whole life 
you know, per Emma's point, you know, can go up and smoke. You know, if you're having sex and you intentionally remove the, the condom, just like if you stole a ratchet set from the Ace Hardware, there's going to be serious consequences. How do you communicate a, a shift or to, right, and or educate, I guess, a population that says, you know, and by the way, right, this, this is another thing you better not even think about doing. How, d d d does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the thing I would say is that this is not that hard. You know, only have sexual contact with another person that you know they also want. And that's not uh, complicated. That's not legalistic. Uh, I think that people uh, are have plenty of practice being kind to each other, being respectful of one another from all from all parts of their lives, not just sexually. Um, and they can put that to use uh, in their sexual relationships as well. The other thing that I would say is that, and I think this is maybe the thing that I would say to the parents who are protective of those boys, is that uh, men and boys are far more likely to be sexually assaulted themselves than to be falsely accused of sexual assault. So there's this moment that has stuck with me of when uh, during uh, the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, when there was sort of a lot of polarization around sexual violence in the US, someone asked, um, Don Jr., are you more worried about your boys or your girls? And he said, my boys. And what everyone knew he meant in that moment was I'm more worried that my boys will be accused of sexual assault falsely than that my girls will be sexually assaulted. But he should be worried about all of his kids for the same reason, which is that they're the primary thing they are all at risk of is to be victimized themselves. And I think that shifting that, so we are, uh, you know, this doesn't, you know, we're not thinking about some kind of, uh, you know, politicized war between the genders, but instead, you know, how do we keep each other safe? I was just going to go to that point and ask you that, which is, so the, the spirit of the comment, right, which is from the, from the man that Emma describes at the hearing is, is based in some misguided though you may think it is some concept of mercy right is that right some sense of compassion towards this 18 19 year old boy what why doesn't that guy see with the same measure of compassion the young female i'm not prepared to say it's malicious um, <laughs> you are? Is it, I'm thinking, is it as black and white as that? Is he's more important than her? I don't, I think that it is probably right that that, that legislator has not, you know, sat down at breakfast that morning and said, you know what, I think that boy, the, you know, boys' futures are more important than girls' futures because, you know, I have bought into millennia of misogyny. I think it's probably not at that level of consciousness, but I do think it's sexist. And I think the fact that you haven't, that it doesn't occur to you to think about the impact on the victim uh, isn't a, um, you know, it, it doesn't... That, that's not much better than it being, you know, from, than you know, having malintent front of mind. I don't think I would push back on the idea that 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 legis that uh, I guess lobbyist legislator has um, that what he has in mind is compassion. Because I think there's a difference between compassion and impunity. I think that compassion is saying you did something really wrong here, and you're going to have to be held to account for that, and you're going to have to. Uh, you know, restore the harm that you've done? What are you, you know, how are you, you know, how are you going to apologize? How are you going to make up for this? How are you going to do better? And, and here's the compassionate part, I believe that you can. I believe that even though you've done a bad thing, that that doesn't mean that you're a bad person forever. And I believe that you can make up for this. And that's compassion, but just saying, oh, boys will be boys, you know, what 17 year old hasn't purposely taken off a condom in the middle of sex when they knew their partner didn't want that. That actually, to me, that's insulting. If I were a 17 year old boy, I would be insulted by that. My my instinct would be to yell at the guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, so. But but like at the same point, right, after yelling at, you know, my family members right over Trump for three years. Right. There's this moment in time where you're like, well, 
I can keep yelling, but it doesn't seem to be productive. So, so to that guy, and I think I think that guy Emma is describing is important to talk about because what what is it that you say to him, right? That that gives you the best possibility of of changing his perspective, right? Which is, you know, yes, but. Have you thought about it this way from the perspective of the victim? And, right, that I'm sure, right, that per the earlier part of the conversation, if if you were to talk about violent, forcible rape, right, in the, you know, old paradigm and stereotype of sexual predator jumping out of the bushes with a knife, you know that that he would condemn it vigorously. So so what what do you say to that guy, right? Uh, about an issue like this, where he actually said what he, what he said out loud, which at the same time is shocking, right? Right, jaw dropping, but completely unsurprising. Yeah, I mean, partially, I would just want, like, I would want him to hear Emma's testimony. I would want him to hear from someone about the actual concrete impact that it's had on their lives, which um, I think just makes it harder to disregard. I've also found that I, you know, I, I've had, I think it sounds like similar experiences to yours where uh, you sort of learn at a certain point that the yelling is not getting through to people. And I've spent a lot of time over, you know, the last decade talking to people who have been skeptical of Me Too, have been skeptical of the movement against sexual assault on college campuses. And the thing that I have found most effective is just like you figure out what matters to them. And I mean, this is, I guess this is politics. You would know better than me, but you know, you figure out what matters to them. What is it that's motivating them to come, you know, to, to feel defensive? And you show them how those concerns also are, should also make them care about survivors. So, you know, if they're worried about innocent men losing their livelihoods, you talk about the economic impact that, uh, you know, violence has on victims. Um, if they're talking, you know, I, you know, again, in my education work, I hear all the time from people saying that they're worried about, you know, you know, falsely accused boys missing out on school and you talk to them about how hard it is for survivors to continue to learn in the wake of violence. And you just, you know, you figure out that entry point. And I think it's, you know, I wish there was one like magical thing you could say to everyone to convince them. I feel like uh, we would be in a different place if there if there were. And how, how does it feel for you to hear from a young woman like Emma, who's not too far behind you, um, you I'm know, very flattered by that, by the way. I'm 33, so I'm really right, glad that we you know, decided that Emma and I are I remember, I remember, I remember, like, I was, yeah, 52. I'm like, you're still, like, a lot closer to Emma. And I was just talking about this with someone. I was like, and I was working, I was in a White House when I was, when I was 33 years old. And I, I look back on it and, you know, when I, so young. Right. You know, you're just you're just getting started, you know, despite all the impact, you know, that you've had. But, you know, really a decade into your career, um, you know, that you're an inspiration, you know, for a young woman who says, you know, I can make a difference because, you know, I know you can because we'll look at this. This is what this person's doing. And that person, that person's you. I mean, that's really incredible to hear. And I mean, Emma, hearing that, you know, the uh, the article was able to be helpful to you in some way is just like, what more could anyone ever want um, from from their work? And I guess I would say, you know, this is a long movement. And like, there there were our people um, who were doing this work before me who've been an inspiration for me. And I know that there are going to be, you know, young people who listen to this and listen to Emma speaking and say, you know, I want to, I want to do that. Um, and I think that that's really good news because it's also really hard work. And I know that, uh, you know, people uh, need a break sometimes and no one person is going to be able to show this alone. So how amazing that by trying to make change, we can all inspire other people to try to make change. That's a, that's a hopeful story to me. And, and Emma, when you look ahead now for you, you have, you know, a couple of years of college left ahead of you, but your activism now has become part of your life. 
um, your desire to change. So what are the three things that you want to leave us with um, today? And, you know, for people out there that you want to know, you want them to know uh, about this issue um, and what you're going to be doing in the immediate future about it. That is a great question. Um, first, I just want to say, like, just backtracking a little bit that, Alexandra, you have been like the beacon of light in this, all of this turmoil. And I am so glad. And I, um, it obviously just takes one person to spark change. And I think you've done it. And I'm like eternally grateful that you wrote that review and that now like we're speaking, this is something obviously I never would have thought would have happened to me and to have someone ha have already put in place that, you know, this is wrong and then we can work from there. Um, this is phenomenal to me because I have a ground to stand on because of you. And um, I guess from that is that stealthing is sexual assault point blank. It's wrong. You do not take off a condom without the other person's consent and have it be okay right? You're doing it without their consent because you know it's wrong. Because if you were to ask, they would have said no, right? Or if they were okay with it, then you continue, but you're doing it in secret because most likely, you know, the other party would decline. That's just wrong. Um, stealthing is sexual assault. Um, two, I think there's so much work to be done and just spreading the word is crucial. Um, you know, this is like baby steps. I mean, big baby steps, but this is a, um, in terms of legislation and getting this to be recognized, we are at the beginning. So even just having this um, is phenomenal. And just talk to your children, talk to your friends, talk to your grandparents, right? Because the more we talk about things and the more accepted they are, the, you know, this isn't going to be taboo. Like, I feel like I'm very proud of my generation to that we have such a strong voice and we're not scared to talk about sex or what's wrong and consent. And we have a strong, we just have a very strong voice. So I, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, when this happens to someone, I, I think a lot of the time you can be very ashamed. I felt very ashamed and we shouldn't be, it's um, never your fault, right? It, it wasn't my fault, it wasn't your fault. Um, and I, I think that the more we accept and we help just help and be believe survivors, you know, it, there's nothing worse than someone saying you're wrong when something happened to you. There should be a community for you and I'm, going to do everything in my power to build and progress and make this recognized in America. I, I where, where can people find more information on your organization? As of right now, we have an Instagram account at the adjacent project. We're starting there. I think as of soon, we're going to start getting bigger. Um, this has been a tremendous and, you know, we had to kind of take a pause to protect our family and um recently we've been able to start going again and we're not going to stop so it would be lovely if everyone or even a few just followed the journey because it's going to be a long one thank you both we'll leave it there thank you.